Welcome to week one of Color in Production. My name is Bill Sweeney. I'm your instructor. And we are going to talk very briefly about color. Since the first week, we are going to be focusing on color. Actually, we'll be focusing on color through all four weeks, but using different aspects of color. We're going to start off in a very general way by discussing color and its role in art and in graphic design. So the study of graphic design, color theory arose in the 1800s. It began to shift away from science into a pure art. Color theory requires some understanding of basic scientific principles about color and perception. Much of modern day color theory comes from the way people view, think about, and interact with color. The basic scientific principles, obviously, and perception play a role in our determining the way people think, view, and interact with color. And you'll read more about this when you do the, the readings that are associated with this course. Many people can look at something and tell you that the colors clash, but they cannot explain why. Many people are not trained in the use of color. Someone who has studied color theory can look at the same object and discuss how the use of saturation of color or tone Placement and context can com combine to make them clash. This is primarily what we're focusing on this week, an understanding of how to utilize color, how to, how to uh, incorporate placement and context. Color harmonies are basic techniques for combining colors. So what are com color harmonies? Complementary. Now, we are going to be actually working with these different color harmonies uh, this week in one of our projects. And a little later on, I'm going to go through a process of showing you how you might approach preparing the piece of art that you're going to produce for me to show you some of these color relationships. So again, complementary colors that are opposite of each other on the color wheel are considered to be complementary colors. So if you take a look, the way this is being described to you is that we have red and green in opposition to one another in complement of one another. The high contrast of complementary color creates a vibrant look, especially when used at full saturation. This color scheme must be managed well so it is not too jarring. So again, you can play around with these colors as long as you understand that when you're dealing with colors that are opposite of one another on the color wheel, that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with complementary colors. Complementary colors are tricky to use in large doses, but work well when you want something to stand out. Complementary colors are real bad for text. In normal circumstances, there are times decoratively when they can work very well, but as a rule, Analogous. Analogous color schemes use colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. So if you take a look, we have our green, and next to the green is the blue and the uh, yellow green. So those three colors are analogous to one another because they are next to the green. They are, they are the colors that sit opposite, or not opposite, but adjacent to the, the primary color, in this case, green. They usually match well and create serene and comfortable designs. You can see for yourself these colors relate very well to one another. Analogous color schemes are often found in nature and are harmonious, harmonious and pleasing to the eye. Make sure you have enough contrast when choosing an analogous color scheme. Choose one color to dominate, a second to support. What that means essentially is you're going to use one as the center of focus and the other will, will support that center of focus color. The third color is used along with black, white, or gray as an accent. So see, these colors pair with black, white, or gray. Triadic. A triadic color scheme uses colors that are evenly spaced around the color wheel. So, I mean, you can choose this triadic relationship out of all the colors. In this particular case, you've got kind of a purple, orange, and green relationship. The triadic color 
harmonies tend to be more vibrant, even if you use pale or unsaturated versions of your hues. To use a triadic harmony successfully, the colors should be carefully balanced. Let one color dominate and use the other two for accent. This is much to how you would also work with analogous colors. I mean, obviously you're going to pick one as the center of focus. You can't really use all three colors as a center of focus. It makes no logical sense. So what you're gonna do is you're going to be using one as the principal or the primary center staging, so to speak, while the others are secondary to it. Split complement. The split complementary color scheme, this is a really simple one to figure out if you really want to know the truth. Obviously, what you're going to do is you're going to choose your two complementary colors. In this case, they're choosing the green and the red, and they're splitting one. So it, you could just as easily have gone with the blue and the yellow-green as opposed to the, the uh, violet and the um, uh, orange as opposed to complement, which is uh, the red. So if you look at what it's doing, uh, it's a, vari a variation on the complementary color scheme. In addition to the base color, it uses the two adjacents to its complement. The color scheme has the same strong visual contrast as the complementary color scheme, uh, but has less tension. The split complementary color scheme is often a good choice for beginners. It's difficult to mess up. Tetradic. The rectangle or tetradic color scheme uses four colors arranged into two complementary pairs. So actually, if you really look at this carefully, it's easy to see them. You've got red and green, and you've got blue and uh, ye um, yellow green. It looks like it's ye or not yellow green, yellow orange. So, I mean, it's very easy to spot these two complements, but instead of just two complements, you've got four complements. Very simple. The rich color scheme offers, offers plenty of possibilities for variation. The tetradic color scheme works best if you let one color be dominant. I think you're gonna find that this primarily is a, uh, a repeating of what, whenever you're working with more than one complementary color scheme, you're going to find that you're always going to want to have one which is the dominant and the others are supportive. You should also pay attention to the balance between warm and cool colors when using these colors in your design. And the square. Square is similar to the rectangle. But again, it's got four colors spaced evenly around the colored circle. And also notice that it is complement. You've got green and red. You've got blue and yellow or blue and yellow orange there or yellow. Yeah, I guess it's yellow orange. Um, and they're, they're complement of one another. So the square color sh scheme works if you let one color be dominant. I'm beginning to sound repetitious, but that's... That's the facts with it. You should also pay attention to the balance between warm and cool colors in your design. So what are color models? The next thing that we're gonna be getting into, because again, what we've just looked at are some of the basic premises. And you'll find that there are other uh, color relationships that you're going to be covering uh, in this, uh, this week's lesson. But where we're heading for this is the use of color models. And what is a color model? Well, let's take a look and see. A color model is an abstract mathematical model describing the way colors can be represented as numbers, typically of three or four values or color components. Have any of you seen this before? If you've been in programs like Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop, and you've looked at some of the color libraries, you'll see that there are different groups of colors that are being displayed there. There are CMYK colors, there are RGB colors, there are grayscale, there's hexadecimal colors. All of these different colors are in fact different color models. And I'm gonna be talking about those color models in a minute. Typically, of the three or four values of color components, when this model is associated with a precise description of how the components are to be interpreted, viewing conditions, et cetera, 
etc. The resulting set of colors is called a color space. So a color space is a range of colors within a color model. The RGB color model. So this is the first of the ones that we're going to be talking about. Um, basically, media that transmit light, such as television or your computer screen, use additive color mixing with primary colors of red, green, and blue, each of which stimulates one of the three types of eye color receptors. As little stimulation as possible of the other two. This is called RGB color space. Mixtures of light of these primary colors cover a large part of the human color space and thus produce a large part of human color experiences. This is why color television sets or color computer monitors need only produce mixtures of red, green, and blue. See additive color. We'll talk about that later on. Other primary colors could in principle be used, but with red, green, and blue, the largest portion of the human color space can be captured. Unfortunately, there is no exact consensus as to what logic in the chromatic diagram of red, green, and blue colors sh should have. So the same RGB values can give rays to slightly different colors on different screens. Essentially what that's saying is that when you are um, working with different computer screens, you're going to find that there's differences in the way colors are presented to you. That's a device issue. It's not so much an issue of the RGB color model. It's an issue of the limitations within a particular device. When I mean device, I'm talking about a PC computer as opposed to a Macintosh computer. Computer. That's what I mean when I'm talking about devices. CMYK color model. This week, weeks three and weeks four, and I guess a little bit in week two, we're going to be working on projects that involve creating artwork for print. And we will be working with multi print, and we will be working with four color process. Four color process employs the CMYK color model. Um, multicolor print usually employs Pantone. We will be talking about Pantone in just a moment. But right for now, we'll talk about the CMYK color model. It's possible to achieve a large range of colors seen by humans by combining cyan, magenta, and yellow transparent dyes or inks on a white substrate. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about taking a piece of paper and laying down a series of dots of cyan, magenta, and yellow color using different levels of transparency or different size to create uh, a combination of these colors to produce a range of colors. These are the subtractive primary colors. Often a fourth color ink, black, is added to improve reproduction of some dark colors. This is called CMY or CMYK color space. And to tell you the truth, the majority of the time you're working with CMYK, most of the time the fourth ink, black, is in fact added to the CMY color space. The cyan ink absorbs red light but transmits green and blue. The magenta ink Swords absorbs green light but transmits red and blue. The yellow absorbs blue light but transmits red and green. The white substrate reflects the transmitted light back to the viewer. So if you can imagine, you've got this white that's going to reflect up through you, but what it's going to do ultimately is it's not going to just reflect up to you. It's going to reflect up through the uh, combinations of these other colors which are being laid down onto it. Because in practice, the CMY inks suitable for printing also reflect a little bit of color, making a deep and neutral black impossible, the K, black ink component, usually gets printed last. It's needed to compensate for the deficiency. So what they're saying here essentially is that cyan, magenta, and yellow together really do not have the capability of creating a true black. So in order to offset that problem or that limitation, uh, a black, a neutral black is 
introduced as a fourth color print over top of the other colors to fill in for the deficiency in the black. Use of a separate black ink is also economically driven when a lot of black component is expected, e.g. in text media. Uh, matter of fact, it's usually a very good idea to specify text in black and to eliminate the CMYK version of the text just to do the text in black, making it a lot easier and cleaner to lay a layer down of black as opposed to uh, the four color process and trying to register, especially on fine text. To reduce simultaneous use of the three color inks, the dyes use a traditional color, photographic print and slides are much more perfectly transparent. So a K component is normally not needed or used in those medias. Grayscale. Grayscale mode uses different shades of gray. In an image, the 8-bit images, there can be up to 256 shades of gray. Each pixel of a grayscale, grayscale image has a brightness value ranging from 0 to 255, 0 being black, 255 being pure white. And in between that, you have all the different levels of gray. In 16 and 32-bit images, the number of shades in an image is much greater than that of an 8-bit image. Grayscale values can also be measured in percentages of black ink coverage. This is basically a form of transparency. So 0% coverage would mean that the black is essentially transparent. There's no black. It's not really truly transparent. There's just none of it there. 10% would mean that 90% of the, of the black is missing, so it's only 10% black over top of the white. 100% means it's pure solid black and all the other numbers in between, 40%, 60%, 80%, and you know, 73, 56, all those different numbers offer different percentages of the color, in this case black, giving you a partially transparent. Grayscale mode uses a range defined by the working space settings that you specify in the color settings dialog box. Pantone. This is the last one that we're going to talk about tonight, and this is one that we will be working with in the next two weeks. So Pantone Color. Pantone, first of all, is a corporation headquartered in Carlstadt, New Jersey. It's still there. The company is best known for its Pantone matching system, PMS, which is a proprietary color space. So in other words, this is basically a, a color space that has been established by the Pantone Corporation. And it's used in a variety of industries, primarily printing. So you're going to find that the majority of the printers, especially in the United States, use different forms of the Pantone um, process colors or Pantone colors. Uh, sometimes the manufacturer of color paint and fabric and plastics also employ Pantone colors. The Pantone color matching system is largely a standardized color production system. By standardizing the colors, different manufacturers in different locations can all refer to the Pantone system to make sure the colors match without direct contact with one another. So what that means essentially is by using the Pantone system, if I'm a printer in North Plainfield, New Jersey, and you're uh, a printer that's in, oh, I don't know, let's say California somewhere, you and I could be printing a very similar project for somebody. And by using the Pantone color system, I can guarantee that my colors will match your colors. Your colors will match my colors. So this is, and this is, you know, you pretty much anywhere these colors are used. They're, they're basically set up so that there's a consistency and a guarantee of, of universality of color. So that's really what's important about it. So what we're focusing on, first of all, this week is just color and color relationships. But very quickly next week, we're going to be working into color models. And that's why we're talking a little bit about this tonight. So there's my little, pa uh, my little um, PowerPoint this discussion. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into Adobe Illustrator. And I would like to point out to you that for our, our project and our assessment, we're going to produce the, a, a color wheel. And we're going, to dis, we're going to show some of the different color relationships. And it's going to be up to you to produce a color wheel.
I am going to walk you through my color wheel and how I created my color wheel and hopefully it'll give you some idea of how you can go ahead and create yours. Now, you can go about it in a different way if you want as long as it's a working color wheel. If, if it works, it works. Um, I chose to make what I would call a fairly conventional color wheel. So I started out by going online and locating a color wheel so that I could get the colors. I cheated a little bit, essentially. That's what I did. Let me see if I can come over here and show you my colors. Um, swatches. There's my swatches. Okay, so the first thing is you'll notice down here my swatches panel. I have the default swatches in here. Whenever you open up a new document, your swatches panel looks like this. One of the first things that, that any graphic designer wants to do when they start a project is they want to empty out their swatches panel and they want to start grabbing the color that they're going to be creating in their project. That's the very first thing that you generally do. You know, that's at least the first thing that I always do. So I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. Uh, I'm not going to show you how to do this, do that on this particular piece because I have another piece that I'm going to be working on tonight and I want to show you how that whole thing works. So uh, I'm going to start off by showing you this. This is more or less my final color wheel. Um, I did not start showing the relationships on this particular one. This just shows the basic colors, orange, red, or I mean, it actually, uh, starting here, it's red, and then it's red-orange, and then it's orange, and then it's yellow-orange, and then it's yellow, and then it's yellow-green and green, and then blue-green and blue and blue violet and violet and red violet okay so i'm going to switch over to this and this is what i'm going to be working on tonight so let me just show you what i did uh i have here the 12 hues and what i did was i went in and i grabbed off of an online resource a color wheel and I was able to, by using my little eyedropper tool, it was a bitmap, and by using the eyedropper tool, I was able to go in and I was able to sample all these colors and very quickly come up with my color library. So let me just show you something here, because I started talking about this a minute ago. Let me just quickly show you. I'm going to start off by object. Uh, Oh, let's go to the view menu, show edges. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to remove the stroke on this. All right, so now I just basically have I removed the stroke, and now I just have my fills. I'll bring my fill forward. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. What I want to show you is that I came in here, and I uh, these are all my colors. There's your red. It's ED one E two four. Red orange is F two six six two one. Orange is F seven three nine. I'm sorry, F seven nine three one D. So all these colors, I arrived at by going in and grabbing myself a color wheel just online, which you can do yourself, and that's what I would encourage you to do before you start this, so that you have your um, your colors the way you want them. So the next thing that I would do here is, uh, let's get back to the color swatches for a minute because uh, I, wanna, I wanna point out to you, I wanna point out to you how I, I go about doing this. So the first thing that I'm gonna do here is, I wanna get rid of all these swatches because to be frank with you, I, these are all colors that mean nothing to me in the context of my pro, uh, pro, process here. Uh, although I think some of these are, uh, the colors that I'm looking for, but I'm going to clear them out anyway. This is something that I almost always do, and I recommend you do it too. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here in the swatches panel, drop down menu, and you see where it says select all unused. What that means essentially is it's going to select all the unused colors. So I click, and you'll see that all these colors in here have been selected. They're not being used. And I'm going to hit delete, and delete the swatches, yes. So now they're all gone, except this one little thing here, the little uh, black, I'll hit delete, yes. So now what I'm left with, I'm left with none, registration, white, and black, which is good, because this is colors that I'm gonna leave in here, they're not gonna, they're not gonna be in my way. Uh, 
I'm in a class. But you be quiet. I'm sorry about that. So what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start loading my colors into my swatches panel. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this little icon that I have here, load swatches. And then I'm going to get my eyedropper tool and I'm going to click on the eyedropper tool and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to click on the red. And right away, do you see that the little red fills in here? And you see that there's a little red fill over here. So now what I can do is I can click on that and hold and drag it up and drop it into my swatches panel. And now I have my red color. So then I can come back over here and I can click on the orange. And the other way I could do this is click on this and go new swatch and it'll come up and you'll see it'll bring up the orange. Oh, and by the way, just so that you know, we're going to talk about this uh, next week. I have different color modes in here. Right now we're in CMYK. And the reason I'm in CMYK uh, is because we are going to be working with uh, CMYK this week. But I want to point out to you that other color modes are in here. This is important for you to understand. See, there's your grayscale. There's your RGB. There's your HSB. There's your CMYK. We even have lab. And we have WebSafe RGB. We're going to talk more about this stuff next week. So anyway, I got my orange. I hit OK. And now see my orange is in there. So I got red now and I got orange now. So once again, come over here. I got this tool selected. I'm going to move on to my next color, which is that color right there. And once again, click on that and go new swatch. And then accept it. And now that's in there. And I'm just going to keep going around in a logical progression, making my new swatches until I get all of my colors loaded into here. And see again, what's happening in the swatches palette? I'm getting nothing but the colors that I'm going to use in my projects, okay? So let's keep going and let's keep getting all of my colors in here. I'm gonna drop that down, new swatch. My yellow now comes in, I got my yellow. And then I'm gonna come over to the green, uh, yellow green. And again, click up here and new swatch. I'm adding the green now and coming to the primary green. Click here again, new swatch and hit OK. Very simple. You're just basically loading the colors into this little shape right here using your eyedropper tool. I mean, I could do this. I'll show you in a second. There's another way I could do this. I could click on that, go new swatch and hit OK. I could simply come over here. And I could get my regular selection tool. And since this is basically a vector graphic that I created, um, what I've done here is I've clicked on that and see this is grouped. Okay. So if I wanted to, to do this the way I want to do it right now, instead of using the regular selection tool, I could come over here and I could use what's called the group selection tool. You see the little group selection tool? By clicking on that, I can come over and I can click on the blue. I think I got the blue in there. I'll click on the dark blue. And you see there's the dark blue in my fill. And I can click here and go new swatch. And now I get my dark blue in there. And there's my dark blue. And if I want to, I can just keep going with the last few of these this way. New swatch. And I got the dark blue. And now my purple. And new swatch. OK. And then the last one, which is this guy right here, click new swatch and hit OK. So now if you take a look, I have all of my colors. These are all the colors that I'm going to be using to create my, um, my color wheel. And again, that's how I would have you proceed doing this. I can close this. Now I'm done with it. Now here's the thing that I want to do. I want to point out a couple of things down here before I move on. Let me zoom in down here. So now I have my color wheel. And what I have to do is I have to show you, or you have to show me color relationships. So not only are you going to create a color wheel, but what you're going to do is you're going to come up with some method. And this looks like I didn't get the stroke off of it. Let me get that stroke off of it. So you're going to come up with some method of showing color relationships. Okay. So in this particular case, this color relationship is complementary. So you see what I did here was I used some basic shapes. There's a line. 
okay? Actually, it's not just a line. It's a line that has arrowhead associated with it. Let's go uh, edit. Uh, yeah, let me see here. Edit, uh, undo, move. That's what we want. Edit, undo, move. So if I go to the window menu and I go to stroke, okay, and I open up my stroke, show options. Okay, so here's what I want to show you. Um, this is basically just a three-point line. That's all this is. And what I did over here was I added arrowheads. Now watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to click on this, and I'm going to add a different arrowhead. You see the different arrowhead? Look, click here, and I'll change the arrowhead to that arrowhead. Okay, so I, I thought edit undo, and edit undo. Okay, so that's really all it is. It's just basically taking my line tool, clicking, holding down the shift key, and creating that. Uh, now, normally, you would not get these arrowheads, okay? There'd be none on it. This is what you would normally get, just so that you understand. Uh, the reason I got those arrowheads when I made that line was because I already had them applied and I had this selected and it defaulted to what I was originally working on, which is uh, creating a line with an arrowhead. So this is what would happen if you create a line normally. And then, of course, what you're going to do is you're going to come in here and you're going to choose an arrowhead for that, just like that. And you're going to choose an arrowhead for that, just like that. So it is the top arrowhead or the uh, right arrowhead and the left arrowhead over here. Okay, so that's really all you're doing. And the reason I'm choosing two in this particular case is because we're talking about complementary. And notice that I've actually taken the word complementary and I've included complementary into my visual representation of my color scheme. Now what I want to do is I want to highlight this even more. So this guy here, here's what I'm going to do. I'll show you a neat little trick how you could do this as well. Let me close this up for a second because I'm not really using these right now. Get myself some more room. I am going to go over, I'm going to go to Window, and I'm going to open up Transparency. Okay, so we have this palette in here called Transparency. And if you can see, I deselect this. When I click on something, it shows. So you see how these guys are grouped up here? I'm going to ungroup this. Object, ungroup all. There, so you see the orange is selected, and then that one is selected, and that one is selected. Okay, so what I want to show here is I want to show a complementary relationship. And actually, I am sort of showing it, but I want to show it in a slightly more interesting way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what's called a marquee. I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to click, and I'm going to drag down through those colors right there. I'm going to leave that one alone, and I'm going to leave that one alone. And take a look at the little icon in here and what the icon is showing. So every color that's on this side of this complementary relation has been displayed, okay, or it's been selected. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to set the opacity to like 50%. So you see what I did? was I lowered the opacity on all those colors so that I could accentuate the use of this color relationship in here. And I'm going to do the same thing to the colors on this side. I'll marquee them, and I'll come over here, and I'll lower the opacity of them to 50. So now what you have is you have a nice representation of a complementary relationship. So I'm just trying to show you some interesting and easy ways of approaching how to maybe uh, set yourself up with a good-looking representation of a color wheel that displays the complementary or whatever the particular color relationship you're asked to display. I'm giving you some creative ideas. That's what this is all about, okay? So now I'm going to view out, go to the view menu, fit all in window, and I'm going to go over to my other, my other um, panel here. And what I want to show you here is how I very quickly went from this, which is just a basic shape, to my sliced up basic shape. I'm slicing it into pie shapes so that I could then turn this thing into my color wheel, okay? Before I do that, let me go back to my color window, col uh, swatches, sorry, swatches. Yeah, so I'll get my swatches out because my swatches are going to be used in this thing.
All right, so let me get my swatches over here. There we go. All right, now, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a basic shape. That's really what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a basic shape, and then I'm going to create a series of lines which have a rotation of 30 degrees. And by doing that, I'm going to segment this in such a way that when I use my Pathfinder palette, which I'll explain to you in a minute, I can actually slice this circle into these nice little slices. They're sort of like pizza slices that I can then color and I end up with a really nice uh, example of a um, color wheel for you, okay? So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna just drag this over to the side so that you can see what I'm about to do. Now, uh, here's my circle, and my circle right now has just a black stroke on it and no fill. Can you see over here? No, no fill and a black uh, outline, back, black stroke. So I'm gonna come in and get my ellipse tool and I'm going to come over I'm going to hold down the shift key and I'm going to drag myself a circle oh let's say about that size that's pretty close again I don't have to be exact now here's here's the important thing to, to know there's a couple of things that are very important here number one you have no fill so if I click inside here okay the only place I can get this is in the middle you see that little dot in the middle there I have that on that's my center point and you'll see up here that this shape is made out of four little anchor points. You see them? These are great guides. And I also have my rulers out. Now, I don't know, you know how much you know about Illustrator. I'm hoping you know a good bit about it. But if I want my rulers, I go to the View menu, and I go to Rulers, and I go Show Rulers. Now, this says Hide Rulers. The reason it's saying Hide Rulers is because my Show Rulers, my rulers are showing. So I can hide them, but I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to click off of that. All right, so I want to click on this guy because the first thing that I want to do is I want to set some guides up, which will make it easier for me to do all this. So the first thing I'm going to do is come over and I'm going to click on the ruler. I'm holding the mouse down and I'm going to drag a guide out. And I'm going to bring the guide out and I'm going to line it up right in the middle of that object, right like that. There. Oh, and I got to go to the view menu, guides, and show the guides. There's the guides, okay? So actually, I have some old guides here, and let's go to the view menu and go guides, and let's uh, unlock the guides, and let me get rid of that guide because I don't really need it right now. All right, I'm just, I unlocked it, and I'm selecting it and deleting it. Okay, but now I have my guide. There's my guide, and it's pretty much in the middle. And then I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to click, and I'm going to drag another guide like that. Okay, so now i got my two guides. And what I'm going to do next is, let's see if this, yeah, I guess that's about as good as it goes. That's pretty good. So I, it's more or less hitting right in the middle here. That's what I want to do. So the next thing I want to do is go to the view menu and go to guides, and I want to lock the guides. So now the guides are locked. You can't interact with them, but they're there. All right, so this helps me to find where the center is, the center point is. So this is the beginning of my uh, art that's going to end up being my wedge shapes to create uh, my um, uh, my color wheel. So I select it first of all, and so I recognize where my points are, and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to grab the line tool, and I'm going to come over on that guide, and you notice that the line tool gives you this little bomb sight, little gun sight, and uh, I'm going to come over and I'm going to lay that right on top of that line, and I'm going to hold the shift key down, and I'm going to draw a straight line right to there. So what I've done essentially is I've created a line that bisects that circle, creates a half of that circle, okay? Now what I need to do is I need to start taking this line and turning it into um, additional lines that are going to divide this up. Now, I've done this many times, and I happen to know that the rotation angle that I need to make this work is 30 degrees. So I'm telling you that now, if you want to do this, the rotation is 30 degrees, uh, and you can just try it yourself. So with, with the um, circle deselected and the line selected, you can see it's selected because it's got the little red dot there, and the hot line is highlighted in red. I'm going to come over here in my tool and double-click on the rotate tool. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, choose 30 degrees, and then I'm going to hit Preview. And you see how it moved 30 degrees? But 
the original's gone. But if I come over here, you see where it says copy? I can hit copy and watch what happens. I get my original left alone, and now I have added one more to it. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to double click on this and I'm going to do the same thing. See with preview, it's now moved on to the next one and I'm going to hit copy and see that? Isn't this easy? It's amazing. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue going in the same direction. I'm going to double click on this and with the preview, it's going to be 30 degrees again. I haven't changed anything. I hit copy and now I have half of my slices ready to go. It's really very easy. As a matter of fact, I personally think that this is a lot of fun. This program is a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. If you know a little bit about what you're doing and if you think about things, you're going to have no trouble handling this. So now you see I've got this part done and this part done, but I still got to continue down through here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to double click on the rotation and once again, it moves it down. By hitting copy, I make a copy of the line, and I've added one more line. I only need one more, and I've actually created my entire pie. So double-click it one more time, and 30 degrees, copy, and there you go. And now what I'm going to do is deselect so we can look at this. So you see it looks exactly like that, and now we're ready to turn this thing into a pie. Okay, so in order to turn this into a pie, what we're going to do is we're going to select the whole thing and we're going to use another really cool panel called the Pathfinder panel. With the Pathfinder panel out, I can do things like merge objects together, you know, uniting them. You can make minus front or minus um, or intersect, I'm sorry. Uh, but the one that I'm looking for is right here and it's called the divide. And what divide actually does is it takes all of those shapes and it divides them all up into bits. It's very cool. So let's do that and let's see what happens. With everything selected, that's the key here, everything selected, I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna hit divide, watch what happens. So basically what happens is everything outside, those little bits disappear. But all of these shapes now, even though they're grouped together, they're all individual little wedges. So the first thing I'm going to do is select it, and I'm going to go Object, Ungroup. And now I can come in here and I can click on any one of these individual shapes. And I can start by bringing my fill forward, okay? I can start loading my colors in. So there's the first one. Let's click on the next one. And let's load the next one in. And just so that you know, I put my colors in the proper order. So really, all I have to do is very carefully click on each one of these little shapes. And it's one, two, and now we're going to go to three. And I'm going to go to four. Did I select, get it selected? I didn't. There we go. Four. And four is the yellow. There we go. And then I'm going to go with the yellow-green. One, two, three, four, five. I don't want to miss one. There we go. And then this one here is that. And then this one here is the green. And then we have the blue, the darker blue. And then the, ver the indigo color. And then this guy right here. And that guy right there, which is the violet. And there I've created, let's go, let's select this. Let's do one thing. Let's remove the black stroke because we don't really need it here. And there we have another version of the color wheel. So, you know, you could do this. You could also do this. So how do I, how do, I do this with those center punched out like that? Well, let me show you because that's something that you're going to find interesting as well. Go to the view menu and let's go to the um, guides and let's hide the guides. Okay. So how do I make this other version? Let me move this out of the way a little bit because we're done with it. Okay. Let's move this over. So what I have here is I have exactly the same thing, only it hasn't been turned into a, uh, a pie yet. It's basically just raw shapes. There's your lines, and there is your 
your oval. All right, so what I want to do is I want to make this donut, and then I want to slice the donut up. So here's what I'm going to do. With the, um, with the background circle selected, I am going to go edit copy, edit paste in place. So now what I've done essentially is I've placed in front of the um, uh, front circle, I've placed another circle. So there's now two circles. I'm going to get the free transform tool and I'm going to use the shift key and the alt key. I think it's the option, alt option key, option on the Mac, alt on the PC. And I'm going to start slowly bringing my circle in. And notice that when I do it this way, what it's doing is it's essentially reducing towards the middle of my, of my object. And then when I get it to about where I want it, which is, oh, I don't know, maybe like that, I can let go and I can deselect. So now you see what I got? I have basically a donut uh, and I have these lines. But I got this stuff in the middle and I'm going to have to see how that works. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to carve this up in exactly the same way. I select the whole thing by marquee it. And then I come over here to the Pathfinder and I hit Divide. And I go Object Ungroup. And I end up with actually two series of, of, um, of uh, pies. And I only want the one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to marquee that center stuff. Do you see how I got the center stuff marqueed? And I'm going to hit Delete. And I've basically thrown it away. So now what I have essentially is something just like that. And I can come in here and uh, I can start clicking on my shapes and I can start loading my colors in. Whoops, I should bring the fill forward. Uh, and then I'll click on this guy right here and I can load that color in. And then the next color. And the next color. The next color. And so on, uh, yeah, so on. I just don't want to miss a color. So I'm trying to be careful, make sure I do it right. Blue, and then the regular blue, and the indigo blue. And there, we're almost done. There we go. And finally, that. And there you have, there's two completely different ways that you can uh, create a, um, a color wheel. So at least now you have some idea of how you go about making a color wheel. And the other thing that I want you to understand is that you're going to also you're going to also come in here and you're going to also come up with some way of showing the color relationships because this is this is like a two part project part of the project number one part of the project is that you somehow or other uh, differentiate the different color uh, relationships in the particular case here we're talking about complementary so you know you're going to come up with some mechanism that you're going to use to di uh, differentiate complementary and I showed you a demonstration of how I would do it over here. Does that mean you have to do it that way? No, I'm just trying to give you an idea as to how you might go about doing it. And I would have no problem whatsoever if you did something that resembles what I did. Uh, that's not a problem at all, as long as you do it by yourself. And then, of course, you could do something like this where you don't have the hole punched into it. And I, you know, I don't know whether you want to leave a stroke on it or not. You can remove the stroke. You know, uh, and that looks good. What what I think also looks good is if you select this whole thing and you keep your stroke over here and double click on the stroke, uh, you can come and you can place like a gray. I think sometimes you'll find that a neutral gray looks good as a stroke. Watch when I deselect it. See how nice that looks with a nice little neutral gray stroke? So, I mean, that's something that you can do to finish this off. But the bottom line is I've just demonstrated for you how you're going to approach your assignment. I did not show you how to go and do all the other uh, color relationships. I demonstrated how to do a complementary. The, the, the same kind of idea would apply to the other color relationships you're going to do. And I think you've got like three of them to do. Off the top of my head, I don't exactly remember which ones they were uh, asking you to do. Um, but at any rate, uh, you're going to do those color relationships. And I don't know. Let's see how this looks. Let me come over here and click on this whole thing. And let's throw a 
stroke of neutral gray on that as well. I'm kind of curious to see what that's going to look like with a neutral gray stroke on it. See how that looks. Yeah, see, and that looks pretty nice too. Uh, actually, it's very nice. So what this little neutral gray stroke does, I think it helps to differentiate the colors. It keeps them off of one other a little bit. Um, that's always a good thing to do when you have these color relationships. That's something that's going to keep them apart ever so slightly. Uh, you know, you could go with white if you want. Let's see what white looks like. I mean, you could go with white. You could go with black. Let's double click and let's try white because I don't think I've tried white yet. Let's see what white does for it. Yeah. So you see, that doesn't look too bad either. So, I mean, from a creative standpoint, this isn't the most creative project to work with, but you know, you could maybe try making it a little bit creative if you want. You could see, maybe you could do something a little bit more interesting than uh, I'm doing with this, but I definitely think that all you need to do for me is to come up with a reasonable facsimile of a color wheel in Adobe Illustrator. This is a vector art project, and I'll be totally honest with you. I do believe that you're going to want to do this in Adobe Illustrator. It is the best way to go. One of the things from a production standpoint, since this is a color and production class, one of the things that I do demand of you is that you start thinking like a designer in terms of production. So when you're working with different types of art, it's really a good idea to make sure that you're using the right program or the right application. When you're working on something like this, which is pretty much a vector project, to be totally honest with you, I do believe that... Um, Illustrator is the way to go and some people really love Illustrator and some people really hate it and I don't want any of you to hate it. I want you all to love it. It's a very powerful program. It can do tremendous things for you and all you have to do is become used to it. Once you become used to it, you're going to find that it's truly a great friend to you. So that's that and uh, that leads me on to the second part, which is our, I guess it's our assessment. And the assessment that I have here, just so that you know, is um, I'm going to uh, be creating analogous, complementary or split complementary and tertiary colors. Okay. So once again, I got the same situation over here. I'm not going to do this again, but what I would ultimately do here is I would go in and I would clear all this out like this, select all unused, and I would hit the garbage can, get rid of it. And then what I would do is I would bring one of my um, one of my uh, color wheels in, and I would load up all of my colors into that swatch. Now I want to show you something interesting. Let's go down to this. All right. So the first thing I'm going to show you is if you zoom out. Let's go zoom out a bit. Uh, there we go. Yeah. So uh, we're looking at primary colors. So you've got your red, you've got your blue, and you've got your yellow. Those are your primary colors. And uh, I'm going to zoom out. Let's fit this fit artboard and window. There we go. And I don't want the analogous. I think I want the primary. Yes. So here's what it is. This week's assignment is for you. There's a certain size that you're going to work with. I don't remember. I think it might be eight by eight inches. You'll find it listed in your assignment. So what I'm looking for you to do is I'm looking for you to take some sort of a creative uh, layout, to come up with some sort of a creative graphic layout showing graphic elements and what you're going to do is you're going to use different color relationships within that graphic element. So take a look at what I have here. I have, uh, and I have another one I'm going to show you after this, but I'll start with this one. Uh, oh, and another thing I want to point out to you is go to the window menu and go to layers, bring the layers panel out. Okay, so I got my layers. Uh, so I'm going to lock that. I'm going to come to the sample. So here I have basically my, uh, my layout, which I live in New Jersey. And where I live in New Jersey is very close to the border of Pennsylvania. And one of the things that I see constantly as I get closer and closer to Pennsylvania is farms that have Pennsylvania Dutch hex signs on them. They're prevalent. They're all over the place. And they have a couple of interesting things about them. They're usually always graphic shapes. And this shape that I have here, the flower and heart, is a very classical shape for a duck, Dutch hex sign. And in fact, they generally use red, yellow, and blue 
for this particular element. So that's essentially why I chose this because it was such a classical uh, hex symbol and I just thought it would be an interesting way to go. Do you have to go that way? No, you come up with some creative thing, but that's the whole point. Come up with something creative, think creatively. What, what, what do I know, what do I see, what have I been through that you know, utilizes primary color that I could go in and I could play with a little bit to come up with different color relationships? That's what I'm ha looking for you to do. All right, so this is what I came up with. And as you can see here, I've actually created my um, red, blue, and, and yellow. You'll notice that I've actually grayed out or um, made partially transparent all the other colors so that these stand out. All right, so I'm going to uh, hide the sample, and I'm going to go to the first one, which is analogous. So let me, let me just go over, click on this, and go view, fit, artboard, and window. Okay, analogous. So the key to this whole thing is that I have my analogous colors. And if you remember what I told you about analogous colors is you have a primary color and then you have the two colors that sit opposing it on either side, analogous colors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to literally come in here and I'm going to load my analogous colors into my little uh, symbol. And um, it's interesting how I'm going to do this. I, and again, Part of what I'm trying to show you, or I'm, what I'm, I shouldn't, shouldn't say I'm trying to show you, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get you excited about this program and some of the fun things that you can do with it, all right? So, and I, again, I hope that this does it for you. The most important thing for you to, to know is that I have uh, my different, my different um, color arrangements on layers, okay? So I can literally hide my layers like that bring them back also i can lock my layers meaning essentially that nothing happens to whatever's on those layers because they're locked and that's good because every one of these things let me go view fit all in window and you can see that all of these things basically are set up to look exactly the same except for that 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 and that these guys are all different and in the end, all of these colors are going to change based on my color relationships, okay? So if I had all of these unlocked, okay, and if I come in here and if I clicked on the blue, and if I go to the select menu, same fill, do you see how everything that's blue selects? That's no good at all because then if I come in here and I start changing my colors over here, it's going to change all of them and it's going to mess them up. So I'm going to go select, deselect, and I'm going to go back in. I'm working on analogous. I'm going to lock that one, lock that one, lock that one, click on the analogous and go view, fit, artboard, and window. And then now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to click on the blue and select same fill color. Now I have I have red, yellow and blue. I so I'm going to change all of these, but here I have um, I have this purple color. There are, it's actually red, red violet and uh, red and then uh, red yellow or red orange. So I think what I'm going to do just so that you can see this whole thing work, I'm going to get my eyedropper tool and I'm going to click on the red and I'm going to change that one to red, okay? So that's the blue. I've changed it to red. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to click on the yellow and I'm going to go select same fill color. And all of that comes up. So I got red so far and I'm going to go in and I'm going to click on my eyedropper tool and I'm going to change that to orange. And then I'll select my third color here and I'm going to go select same fill color. This is probably not going to work because I've actually got the same color here. Yeah, it's going to select too much. So I'm going to hold down the shift key and deselect that, deselect that, and deselect that. There we go. So I got those. And yeah, that'll work. And then I'm going to come over here at my eyedropper tool, and I'm going to click on the purple. And now I've got, oh, you know what? I forgot control Z. I actually forgot two of my uh, I think it's probably the opposites, that and that. Yeah, I think that's right now. Let's try it again. I click on this and the purple. Yeah, 
and that looks pretty good. So now what I end up with is, uh, go to the view menu, fit all in window. I now have, for part of my assignment, I have my Dutch symbol, and I'm using um, red, yellow, and blue, which are primary colors. And now I've got analogous colors over here on this one. And I'm going to do the same thing with complementary or split complementary and tertiary. Okay, so let's do the tertiary next. I click on that and I go view, fit artboard and window. Because again, I got four artboards. I hope that you guys know how to make artboards in Adobe Illustrator. Um, again, you know, please feel free to give me a call if you need help with any of this. Also, just understand that I'm going to be in the... Um, uh, I'm going to be in the Blackboard Collaborate tomorrow from um, 1 o'clock to 4. And the same with tomorrow's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday. Uh, let me see. Hold on. i give you my schedule. I can just quickly tell you. I think I might have actually sent it to you anyway, but let me just quickly walk you through it again here so that you know. Yeah, so uh, I will be uh, – tomorrow is Tuesday. I'll be there from 1 to 4, and Wednesday from 1 to 4, and Thursday from 1 to 4. And then Friday from 9 to 1, uh, well, actually not this week, because that's only weeks 3 and weeks 4. So really this week, 1 to 4, uh, Monday, when, or Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, okay? So, you know, if you want to come in and meet me and talk to me there, uh, feel free to do so. If you need any help with any of this, come in. I've done this many times. I'll have no trouble helping you with it. Uh, it isn't as much trouble as you might think it is. So so now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to come over here, click on the blue. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, I got to go to analogous, lock analogous, and now I'm on tertiary. So you see, I've got my layers name, so I can now click and unlock tertiary. So when I come over here and click on the blue and go select same fill, uh, where are we at here? Same fill. Okay. I got all of my blue selected, and I get my eyedropper tool, and let's make that purple. Good. And click on the yellow. Select same fill, and we'll make that the orange. Click on that, and that's real good, too. So we see that's working out fine. Click on this. Click on that. Select same fill. And this will go to green. And there we have that. Go to the view menu, fit artboard and window. Oh, sorry, view fit all in window. There we go. And I'm going to lock that and open up the split complement and deselect it. So now you're seeing what your assignment is going to look like. You're going to basically set up um, four different color relationships. Now, this one is an interesting one because it's just going to be complement or split complement. Now, we've actually, um, if you want, you can go uh, split complement, and I'll show you in a minute what split complement will be. So I'm going to zoom into the one that's split complement, okay? And I'm going to go view, fit artboard and window. All right. And actually, you know what? For a second, let me do this. Let me zoom in real close. Right, zoom tool. Let's zoom in here. So we're going to do split complement, all right? So I'm going to click on that. Uh, let's see, object, uh, unlock all. Yeah, click on that. And hold down the shift key and click on that. And I think i got to go to window, transparency. Yep, and i got to bring that up to 100%. Okay, and now this one in the middle here, which is the complement, I'm going to bring that down to 50. So there now we have a split complement. Remember, the split complement means that you have the green here, there's your complement, and we're splitting the complement either side. So you've got the green and the split complement, okay? So I'm going to go view, fit artboard and window, and let's do this, let's do this for the split complement, all right? So what I'm going to do now is actually I'm going to go to the, uh, we've got all these others locked, I think we're good. Try that. All right, so let's come in here and click on the blue, and let's go select same fill color. Uh, I believe that's good. Let me just go view, fit all in window. Yeah, so you see none of these others were selected because the layer is locked. All right, so I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to go view, fit artboard in window. Okay, so 
that select same fill and then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to get my eyedropper tool and let's start off by making that purple. Perfect. Now I'm going to come up to the red, select same fill color, and we're going to make that one the green. Let's make that one the green. There, perfect. And now the one that's over here, I have remember HSB, I, this is not color. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I know it's the yellow. I'm going to click on the yellow and I'm going to go select same fill color. And then I'm going to come over here, and actually this got selected. I'll have to fix that. And I click on my eyedropper tool, and I'm going to click on the uh, orange. There we go. And then this guy here was red. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to come in here. I'm going to go view fit all in window. Yeah. And now with that selected, I'm just going to come over here, and I'm going to sample the red. And I'm put the red back in there. So there you go. So now I basically have, and, and you can see what's really interesting about this is that each one of these color relationships work very nicely. I mean, they all work logically because you're dealing with colors that are uh, a relationship that is, that is a proper relationship of colors, a proper weight balance of colors. So this will be your assessment to come up with one of these. I got one more I'm going to show you because I do have time to do this. I'm going to go file open. Give me a second to browse to this. And I'm going to go to my desktop. Let me go in here to uh, print production. There it is. I see I've passed it. And we'll go to uh, week one. There we go. And let's go to Mondrian. Let's find if I can find my uh, originals. Mondrian RGB. Let's try that. Hit open. Yeah, so here's my Mondrian. Now, I don't know whether you know who Mondrian is, but Mondrian was essentially an artist that uh, created geometric shapes. And this actually is a, a reproduction. I shouldn't even call it a reproduction because it's not so much a reproduction. It's basically my rendition of one of Mondrian's typical paintings. I think I've got something weird going on here. I'm going to select this all and see. Yeah, I think I... Got no strokes on there. All right, I don't know what that is. Looks like there's a stroke. It's not. Okay. Um, yeah. So so uh, Piet Mondrian created, and and again he liked. He tended to like to use these graphic shapes, um, and he liked to use primary colors. So if you look up Piet Mondrian, you'll find that a lot of Mondrian's work has this same kind of um, graphic look to it. You know, it's very stylized and it's very geometric and it uses these primary colors. So the same basic premise where I've created a number of these things. I don't, I think I only got the one in here. Let's see what I got. Um, yeah, I think I only got the one. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I just recolored this. So I'm going to again come in here and click on the red and select same fill color. And then what I'm going to do is come over here and click on my eyedropper, click a color, and now I've got the purple in there. Select the yellow and select same fill color. And then I'll go with, I guess, the orange for that. That'd probably be okay. Click on the orange for that. There we go. And then come over here, and I believe the third one is the blue. Select same uh fill color and then this one is the green click on the green and now you have the same color scheme only in the colors have been modified to tertiary colors so this is just another option i mean it's it's I did two different options, and I, what I did, how I handled this is I thought in terms of primary color. I thought to myself, where can I find primary color? And I happened to know that the um, hex signs, the Pennsylvania Dutch hex signs, they were primary color. So I found the primary color, and I used the primary color. And then, of course, the... Um, 
Mondrian painting, he used primary color and he used very graphic shapes. So in both cases, I thought they would be excellent examples of how you would do this. I added the I added the tertiary color here. I added the actual uh, color wheel with the word tertiary for a number of reasons. Number one, because I'm doing a presentation for you and uh, I wanted to make sure that you understood what I was going for. And I also wanted you to see that, you know, I've actually created these tertiary. I've, I've actually done these things. So you're going to be doing them the same way, or you're going to do them in a similar way. So that's really what the whole thing comes down to. And those are, those are the assignments that you're going to be working on this week. So as I say, I, if you have any questions or any, um, Want some additional help? I mean, you, you obviously are going to look at the uh, recorded session. Uh, you'll be able to see this. But if you need to, come in and see me either on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday between 1 and 4 p.m. Mountain Time. I will be in the uh, Blackboard Collaborate Help Center. And uh, oh, uh, another thing, like I said, I want to point out to you, I left a number of announcements for you, so it's very important you go and take a look at those announcements. Maybe I'll go in and I'll show you the announcements since I have some extra time here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this guy up, and I'm going to come down. I'm going to find my uh, canvas. Give me a second. Come on. Take it forever. All right. Hold on. Let me just log in here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, course, your course. All right, and announcements. So let me just quickly go over some of these announcements here because you see I've got a bunch of them. So um, in this particular case, this is just welcome. Uh, let me open this up because there's some uh, information here I want to just point out to you. So there's a zip file of additional references to help you with your work this mod. This here is my additional references. Um, it basically gives you a bunch of documents that will give you information and also give you some very good links that you can go and you can take a look at. There'll be some videos for you to look at and some websites for you to look at. Uh, before I leave tonight, I also want to open up a document and I want to talk to you uh, very briefly about the, um, this stuff right here, which is the psychology of color. So I've got a bunch of sites on the psychology of color, and uh, I've actually, I think I've actually put that into this as well. The zip file contains this. So there's a lot of things in here. Go back. A lot of things in here that you're going to find very helpful. I, I try to work very hard to put together resources for you that help you learn. And also, yeah, here's another document that has links to the psychology of color. So here's this. This is the actual psychology of color, which I'm going to open up one of before we're done tonight. So that's in there. Um, and then of course, I just want to show you that um, I have a LinkedIn site. I've given you access to my LinkedIn site. I have a WordPress blog and I also have a YouTube site. So you will be seeing this recorded session on the YouTube site, but just so that you know, there's an awful lot of other things I have on the YouTube site. And what I do on my WordPress blog is I generally put artwork that I work on either with other people or by myself, and I talk a little bit about it. So you are welcome to go to the WordPress blog, and you are welcome to take a look at what I have there, and you can comment on it if you'd like. And of course, LinkedIn, you know what LinkedIn is, basically a business um, site for us. And if you want to uh, connect to me via LinkedIn, please feel free to send me um, a request. So those I've given you. And we'll keep going a little bit. Uh, rubrics, this is a very important thing for us to talk about. There are very specific goals that you must meet for your discussions, for your assignments, and for your assessments. So please get the rubrics, open them up, and become familiar with them so that when you submit your work to me, I can give you the highest grade. Nothing's worse than having somebody submit a really nice project to me, and because the rubrics weren't followed, I have to knock points off for it. So please be careful. Go in and get the rubrics. Actually, go in and look at all the announcements. Check out all the announcements. There isn't anything in there that isn't really worthwhile. Go back and see what else there is real quickly. 
um, live sessions. Um, I, I want to point this out to you uh, that when we have these live sessions, which no one is here tonight, but when we have these uh, live sessions, I, I like to have an open mic situation. So it really is great to have open mic so people, you can talk to me directly and question me directly. You don't have to hold your hand up. You don't have to send me little notes. You can just speak out. But in order for this to work, we have to respect for the class above and beyond everything. So that means a couple of things. It means, number one, if you're going to come in and, and take advantage of the open mic, please find a quiet spot to do that. Don't be in a place where there's radios, televisions, people walking around. I even have it here sometimes. Earlier, I had to shut the, the, the speaker down and go and tell my wife I was in a class because she was making noise in the kitchen. All that gets stuck into the recording. And the more messy the recording the more distracting it is. So I do like the idea of the open mics. I just need to let you know that we have to have no distractions. So that's what this is all about. And what else? Uh, Christy Paulson. Christy Paulson is our learning coach. Essentially, she is my assistant here. So there's myself and there's Christy. If you can't for some reason reach me, you can reach Christy. If you can't reach Christy, you can try to reach me. Both of us are here, and if you look down the bottom what Christy has written here, we are here to help you succeed. I want you to keep that in mind. I will do everything I possibly can to help you succeed. The only thing I, I can say to you is I cannot make you succeed if you don't want to succeed. You have to work with me. You have to put the time and the effort in. Any problems that you have, come and find Christy. Come and find myself, and we will – alleviate those problems for you okay so that's basically my uh my announcements for the week uh we have a student success center uh yeah so that's basically what i was talking about the Student Success Center, it basically it's a Blackboard collaborate room where you can come in. And my days, as I told you, my days there are Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday this week. And that's between 1 and 4. So feel free to come in and take advantage of me. I will be there. And uh, I will be more than happy to help you with whatever you need to uh to uh, work on, all right? So that's that. Now, the final thing before we end tonight is I just wanted to come in here and talk a little bit about the psychology of color. Uh, the, the psychology of color is a sort of an, a little extra for you. Uh, the psychology of color is, uh, is really interesting stuff. You've got psychology of color YouTubes here, got psychology of color in marketing, uh, you have the psychology of color in branding. You will probably color in motion. And then just the psychology of color. There's two links for psychology of color. So I'm going to click on one of these links so I can go in and take a look at that and what we come up with. Give me a second to get this to come up. Oh, psychology of color. Okay, so this is the general, general one. Let me just see if I can. Let's see what the next one is. So I think the next one is a specific page. I might be wrong, but let's see. And is it? Come on. Yeah, here we go. All right, psychology of color. So basically, you know, this talks about color, the psychology of color. Color is a meaningful constant for sighted people, powerful psychological tool. Using color psychology, you can send a positive or negative message, engage sales, calm a crowd, or make an athlete jump iron harder, pump iron harder. Employ the latest color psychology in all facets of your marketing and particularly logo design, website design, cover of a book, package, or a product. The field of industrial psychology is a subfield that studies only the psychology of color. It is no accident that Campbell's Soup has used the same four colors on their label for years. This is all, see, this is all great great stuff for you to think about. This is give you an idea of how important color is. And believe me when I tell you, I mean, okay, let's go back for one second. I got one, two, three, four, five, six. I got like six links here. Believe me when I tell you, there's probably 636 links. There might even be 6,000 links that, that have to do with color. Now, do you have to go in and look at all 6,000? 
No. But what, since we're working on color and since we are working on production, my effort has always been to try to put resources in your hands that give you a great deal of information about the particular topic at hand. Right now we're dealing with color. I want to make sure that you have a bunch of stuff that's going to help you become more interesting when it comes to your use of color and also more relevant. So we're talking about the psychology of color. We got black. Black is the color of authority and power. So this, these are all facts that I don't make up. These are facts that have been tested and have been developed over decades of doing research on this. And again, it's on people and how people think, how people feel, how people react. Uh, color is associated with intelligence, doctorate in black robe, black horn rim glasses, black clothes make people appear thinner. It's a somber color, sometimes associated with evil. The cowboy in a black hat was always a bad, almost always a bad guy in the Western Hemisphere. Black is associated with grieving. Black is a serious color that evokes emotions, easy to overwhelm people with too much black. White. For the most part, this is a color associated with purity, wedding dresses, cleanliness, doctors, white coats, the safety of, and that's an interesting too, thing too, because if you think about doctors in their environment, white would be the last thing you think they would wear because it, it shows the dirt so easy, and yet they use it because of the, the factor of cleanliness. Although I think now they're using a lot of blues and light greens. The safety of bright lights, things go bump in the night, not, a bright, not the bright sunshine. It's also used to project the absence of color, neutrality. That's a great one right there. That one is an interesting one. The absence of color. Keep that in mind. In some eastern parts of the world, white, white is associated with mourning. White is already is also associated with creativity. White boards, blank slates. It's a compression of all the colors in the spectrum. Psychology of color, gray. Gray is the most associated with practical, timeless, middle of the road, solid things in life. Too much gray leads to a feeling of nothing. A bit of gray will add that rock feeling to your product. So think back to what I did when I was working with my color wheel. Notice that I went to a neutral gray. What that neutral gray did was it helped me to define and isolate the colors that were being used, keeping them from vibrating against one another. So there's a lot of things that you can do with these colors. Some shades of gray are associated with old age, death taxes, depression, or a lost sense of direction. Silver is an offshoot of gray and often associated with giving a helping hand, strong character, sterling, in fact. Psychology of color red. It goes on and on. You got blue, you got green, you got yellow, you got orange, purple, brown, basics on how to use color together. This is, I'm telling you, this, this page goes on and on with great stuff. Basics on how to use color together. Color si And again, I'm not going to read all of this because I want you to go in and read it too, but I'm going to cover a little bit of it because some of these things we're going to be coming up against. Color psychology is, is a complicated field of study. It goes deep into the meaning of combining colors for a particular de desired effect. We will broad brush some basics that may be well that may well may be enough for you to make good color choices. Monoch monochromatic color schemes. This is the true use of a single color in varying varying shades. So, in other words, monochrome means that you're using one single color and you're modifying the shades of it. It's clean and interesting look. It's smooth, pleasing to the eye, especially in the blues and green hues. Complementary color schemes, high contrast of color, selecting colors directly opposite from one another on the color wheel, such as pink and lime green. This puts a warm color with a cool color and is pleasing to the eye. Triple color schemes use three colors equally spaced from one another around a wheel. It's popular with designers and allows harmonious color schemes. You are at the first flash of color it's important to remember that the color is the first thing you see, the first thing registered by the person who goes to your site. If, if, if it's pleasing, they will read on. If it's displeasing, you may lose them in a nanosecond. So colors do really, Im they, they do impact people. If people see something they don't like, they will basically turn right off to it. And you know, people, there's people that like particular colors. Some people like pink, some people like lime green. Some people like, like dark blue. 
Uh, you've got a couple of books down here, and then you've got some secondary stuff. But this is just one of the links that I've given you. And again, there's others here. Uh, maybe we have a minute still. Let's see what we got here. Uh, we got uh, psychology and culture. This might be interesting. Let's take a quick look at a YouTube. Let's see what this YouTube comes up with. Let's see here. Psychology, uh, choose the right color for your brand using color psychology. Color psychology, part one of three. Let's take a look at this. This is how long? How long does this go? Seven minutes? Let's see what this does. Hi, everybody. It's Adam Duff, and I have another tutorial for you today. And today, the subject is color psychology. Now, why color psychology? Well, for starters, it's something that's present in everyday life. Every choice you make, every piece of clothing you wear, the food you eat, the advertisements you listen to, the way you are affected by your immediate environment, depending on the season, is all influenced by color psychology. And as an artist, it gives you the power to make specific choices, rather than the aesthetic qualities of color, like temperature, or value, or saturation, you can actually start to have a great deal more control and power over the decisions you make as an artist. Okay? Take note of something. I'm going to be speaking fast to this because I have to fit it into a short time span and I got a lot of information to cover. So that being said, let's jump right into it. But the only thing I want to mention is the fact that remember that your emotional state is very, it has, it has an influence on the way you perceive colors emotionally. Your culture also plays a big role in it. And Color psychology is a very young subject. It's in its infancy in the sense that it hasn't been researched that much. Not that many books have been written on it. There hasn't been that much research. And that's because there are so many, so many altering factors to color psychology and how it affects us as individuals. That being said, let's jump right into it. As we can see here, we have our primary colors, yellow, red, and blue. And remember that these are pigment primaries because light have different primaries and mix differently than, than pigments do. Pigments meaning paint and inks. If we look at the color yellow, for instance, generally the color yellow is associated with happiness, with joy, with warmth, and with optimism. If you think about that in relation to real life, think about the sun, our source of life and warmth and comfort. People who are suffering from clinical depression are very often prescribed with yellow tinted glasses because of their, its ability to change the way you perceive your environment and your overall mood. If we continue around and we get our second primary, red. Red is generally associated with intensity. It can be in, uh, intensity or passion, for instance, but that can go two ways. You can have passionate and intense love and romance. You can have passionate and intense anger and fury. Because of red's connection with pain as well, because when we cut ourselves, we see the color red, we can associate that emotionally with pain. Think about if you've seen a horror movie where there's lots of blood. You can actually be afraid of it because of the red and because of red's connection with pain, even though you're not feeling any pain. You can, you can, it can put you in a very strong emotional state. And if we continue, blue is generally a color associated with serenity and balance. It is a neutral color because we see it all the time in the sky and the water. It's very common. There's a reason why blue jeans have maintained their popularity. That's why blue jeans mix and match with, that, with almost anything. Because our mind does not perceive that as being a challenging color. It's something that is present in everyday life. We accept it. However, this is where things start to get interesting. When you actually start to mix colors because you'll start to realize that you can mix emotion the same way you can mix color let's look at the color the secondary color orange first which is ultimately the mix between yellow and red very often the color orange is associated with hunger which is why very often interior decorators use orange to decorate restaurants because it induces a feeling of hunger well define hunger what is hunger i, I you could easily describe what happiness is you can easily define what what anger or sadness is, but define hunger. Why is it harder to define, even though it's something that we feel at birth? It's one of our first and most powerful emotions. Why? Because it's a secondary emotion. It's a mix of different emotions, okay? Let's look at the properties of red. Passion, need, you can associate with that, with the passionate driving force, the need to survive. A driving force that is so intense that if you don't eat for long enough, it can lead you to violence, it can lead you to murder or even cannibalism, right? Furthermore, there's joy and warmth and happiness that you get from eating as well because it's the source of life. This is exactly the same way the, the sun is, where food and sun are essentially the same thing. Food is the derivative of sun. 
So that's essentially what the definition of hunger is. It's a secondary, it's a secondary emotion, a mix of passionate need to survive with the joy associated with survival. And if we continue around, we get purple, which is a mix of red and blue. If we think about that in, in, in terms of psychology, very often it's associated with sensuality, spiritualism, wealth, mystery, royalty, and wisdom. Now, mystery, that's an interesting one. Why mystery? Well, if you think about that in context of real life, purple is a, a far less familiar color, which is why it's very often considered synthetic to a certain degree, because it's unfamiliar. If we think about that in terms of, um, of royalty, think about historically what royalty is. They're a source of leadership. And what is another color that we associate with leadership today? Maybe blue. Think about police officers' uniform. Think about a businessman or a businesswoman or a, or a military officer's formal uniform with his blue suit and his hat. Right? We immediately make that association with authority, which is exactly the same thing, which is a color that we find in this deep royal blue. However, it's not just blue, is it? It's a touch of red, isn't there? And what does that red symbolize if we think about it in terms of history and how leadership has changed over the years? The royal family led and were there to quote unquote maintain peace. But if you said anything slanderous against them, or even you were even accused of saying anything slanderous, or if you refused to pay your taxes, for instance, you could be lynched, you could have you could be burned alive, you could have your family murdered. There was bullying, there was an element of don't screw with us. So there was a tiny touch of aggression, which is why it should be absolutely no surprise why in today's uniforms that generally represent authority, there is a lack of red. They've taken the red out of it. We are maintainers of the peace. We're here to, to, to maintain stability, but we're not here to, to, to flamethrower you if you don't listen to me, right? That being said, let's go around the horn and look at green. Green is generally a, a color that's associated with nature. There's a mix of serenity and joy nature, right? We've got the happiness of, of the sun, and we've got the coolness and calmness of the water. It's a mix of both. And green in and of itself is also considered a neutral color in the sense that it's something we see in the grass and the trees every day, right? Think about green's association in today's day and age, how and how it's used in advertising. Green home, green energy, green lifestyle, green food, green clothing, green car. It's association with environmentally friendly, environmentally aware, with living a healthy organic lifestyle, pure food that isn't processed or made in a factory, food that's actually grown in a farm in a green environment. When we make that association with green, we make an emotional association with nature. Okay? But that's it for part one. In part two, we're going to jump into tertiary colors, saturation, and value. And that's where we're actually going to start to get really specific with emotions. All right? So I'll see you in part two. So there you go. Uh, again, now I'm not going to uh, beat a dead dog with this. I'm not going to make you look at all this stuff because I've given it to you to look at. But I think the important thing for you to take away here at this point is that... Uh, hey everybody, and welcome to part two. Oops. Now, in this part, I'd you know like to be very nice specific if I shut about them what off. emotions are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, essentially, uh, what I'm trying to show you and what I'm trying to express to you is that this is week one. In week one we have the ability to spend our time considering color and what we can learn about color quickly, what we can find out about its use. Next week and in the following three weeks, we're going to begin to get into the hardcore nuts and bolts of color as far as production goes for us as graphic designers. I don't think you're going to find any of this to be overly difficult. I mean, what might be difficult for you is mastering programs like Adobe Illustrator, Adobe InDesign. Those things might be a little difficult. But when you are given the concepts of color in production and the production concepts that I'm going to give you over the next three weeks, I don't think you're going to find them to be too difficult at all. Again, I will be available to you through the entire mod each day, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in Blackboard Collaborate. You can come in anytime. You also have a teaching assistant, so you'll get plenty of help with this, but I think you're going to find that much of this is going to be very easy for you. Uh, I basically have covered pretty much what I wanted to cover for tonight. So uh, in saying that, I will stop my recording. And say good night to everybody, and I will see you 
next week. Or if you stop in to visit me in the, the Student Help Center. Have a good night, everybody.